Well, good morning. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, thank you for being here and entering in to the worship as we meet to exalt His name together. I want to thank Pastor Henderson for the invitation to be here. Our paths have crossed both sides of the pond. I appreciate his friendship and his fellowship and uh, trust that God will continue to use him here along with the leadership to extend the kingdom of God and raise the name and glory of Jesus Christ here in this community. It's been a joy to be part of the Impact Conference along with Dr. Lawson. We trust that God is using his word to bless his people. I remember uh, hearing the story of a lady who was leaving a morning service just like this and said to her pastor on the way out, Pastor, I want to thank you for that message. Well, he said, I appreciate that, but don't thank me, thank the Lord. To which he replied, well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> well, I hope, uh, I, I do hope that the message this morning is that good that you will go away reflecting on God's goodness and rejoicing in God's work in your life. Uh, just one footnote. I did uh, recognize that Pastor Henderson did leave off a very important announcement from the announcements this morning, so I just want to fill you in. A couple of days ago, New Zealand was in Belfast, my hometown, playing a soccer game, and Northern Ireland beat them 1-0. Just need you to know that. <laughs> it should have been on the announcements. I don't know why they left it off, but there you go. And if you want to watch that game, it's on Sky Sports 1 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon here. So there we go. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I want to speak this morning on the subject, ready for anything. Are you ready for anything? Well, you should be and you can be as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because Paul will tell us here in Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now before we read the text of Scripture, let me put this letter in its context. A text ripped from its context becomes a pretext for misunderstanding and error. It's about AD 60, AD 62. This is Paul's first imprisonment. This is one of the prison letters. He's writing from Rome to the church at Philippi, about 800 miles away. He's under house arrest. If you want to put this letter in the context of the book of Acts, it's Acts 28, where Paul is under house arrest. And yet he's preaching and teaching, and the kingdom of God is spreading without hindrance. Uh, the Philippians have sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, to visit Paul in Rome and to bring either material or financial gift to him to ease his imprisonment. And so he writes back to them to thank them. And I just want you to understand, as we hear these words on contentment in the midst of various circumstances, don't be thinking that Paul is writing it from the armchair of a pastor's study. He's writing these words as a prisoner in Rome. And I think that backdrop will just add some color to these words. Listen to what he says in Philippians 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that at now your care, at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ready for anything. That's what Paul is talking about here. And I love the game of golf and I love to play the game of golf. In fact, last Wednesday, Stan and I and Dr. Lawson enjoyed a round of golf at Cape Kidnappers. It was a beautiful day. The sea was uh, like a placid lake. The sun was out. There was hardly a cloud in the sky. We'll take that memory with us for many, many years. I love to play golf, but I'm not sure I want to play the Calcutta Country Club golf course. Because in Calcutta, India, there's this manicured Wonderful golf course, but uh, the reason I don't think I want to play it is Rule 10 in the handbook. And Rule 10 in the handbook of the Calcutta Country and Golf Club is this. 
play the ball where the monkey drops it. Now, let me tell you the story behind the story. Because along the fairways of this beautiful manicured golf course in Calcutta, India, are these lush magnolia trees that have become the home for families of monkeys. And over time, these monkeys have grown uh, in their attraction to bouncing golf balls. And some guy tees up, takes a swing at his ball, it goes down the middle of the fairway, and all of a sudden, there's a rustling of the trees and several monkeys come out and try and grab the ball and scamper back to get away with their crime into the trees. And nine times out of ten, they don't make it because a, 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 a caddy usually chases them down, shouting and swinging a forearm. And before they get back to the trees, many of them drop the ball. Hence, rule ten. Play the ball where the monkey drops it. Now listen to me. Life can be like playing golf at the country club in Calcutta. Life has a way of messing with your game plan. See if you can't identify with this. Uh, you, take, you, you tee life up. You take a good swing at success, hoping for the best. But all of a sudden, life changes. Sickness, financial setback, relational breakdown, betrayal, and the list can go on. And all of a sudden, you find yourself playing out of the rough. And one of the skills you're going to have to learn in life is to play the ball where life drops it. Whatever your circumstance, you're going to have to learn contentment. You're going to have to adjust to all the adjustments of life and do it productively and do it positively. Because it's been well said that life is 10% what you make it. It's 90% how you take it. Life's an issue of attitude. In fact, I would say to you that the quality of your life will depend more on your reactions than your actions. Because you have no way of controlling life. Most of life is outside of our control. And you're going to have to learn the skill of playing the ball where life drops it. Listen to what Warren Wearsby says. We cannot control or change the world around us, but we can control the world within us. It has been well said that what life does to us will depend largely upon what life finds in us. That's a good statement. And what life should find in the Christian is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The indwelling presence and power of Jesus Christ working itself out in the context of everyday circumstances. Sometimes those circumstances are to our liking and at other times they're working against our best led plans. But as a Christian, with Christ in you, the hope of glory, you can be ready for anything. And so I want to come and look at Paul here as he writes to the Philippians and he argues that. He talks about the various circumstances he has been in and yet he's here to tell us he has learned that Christ is enough. He has learned that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And there's three things I want to see. First of all, his celebration. Secondly, his contentment. And thirdly, his confidence. Let's look at his celebration. It's verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished. Paul expresses his thanks to the Philippians. His cup of joy is full and they have had a hand in filling it. See, the background is chapter 2 and verse 24 through 30 where they had sent Epaphroditus with a gift to Paul. And Paul has sent Epaphroditus back a little earlier than they expected because Epaphroditus nearly died in the service of the Apostle Paul. And he sends him back and he explains why he's sending him back in chapter 2. And he wants him to know that he served them well, represented them well, and they need to receive him as one coming home as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so he, he writes with 
several purposes in mind. He, he writes to explain why Epaphroditus is coming back. He, he writes to give them an update on his own situation, that these things have fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel. He writes to warn them about false teachers in chapter 3. He writes to call them to unity in chapter 2 and 4. But mostly, he writes to thank them. You look at the early part of this letter, I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Thank you for sending Epaphroditus. Now I'm sending him back and you need to understand why he's coming home early. He didn't fall down on the job. He almost died in my company. And when we get to this part, he again returns to the theme of thanks. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that at now your, law, your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So this is what I call his celebration. He's rejoicing in the Lord. He's celebrating God's kindness to him through them. Their care, their concern, a couple of things about it. It was real care and it was repeated care. Look at the statement, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. There seems to be an intimacy and an intensity to the bond and relationship between Paul and the Philippians. Greatly rejoiced. That's an interesting phrase, by the way. And, and when you find great joy or greatly rejoicing in the New Testament, you'd be surprised when that kind of language is used. It's used in Luke 2 verse 10 to describe the birth and arrival and incarnation of the Lord Jesus. It's, it's used in Luke 24 and verse 52 to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. It's used in Acts 15 verse 3 to talk about the spread of the gospel and the gathering in of Gentile believers. How interesting that Paul would use that kind of language, great joy, or to rejoice greatly, to speak of their concern for him. By implication, it would communicate there was something special about this relationship where he uses this kind of extravagant language. So it's real care. There's a love between this church and Paul that's almost unlike any other. In fact, he tells us, doesn't he, in verse 15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Something special going on here. But it wasn't only real care, it was repeated care. He tells us here in verse 10 that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Now, if you like horticulture or agriculture, if you've got a little garden you like to work in, this is your kind of word. This speaks of uh, springtime, speaks of flowers that are blossoming or the leaves that are beginning to grow on the branches of a tree, sprouting again, flourishing, blooming. That's our word. And Paul is saying, hey, you know, I haven't heard from you in a while, but now that Epaphroditus has come, you know, I know that your care for me continues. And he says, I, I recognize that while I haven't heard from you for a while, it wasn't that you didn't care. It was you lacked opportunity to express that care. But recently, Epaphroditus come and your love for me has blossomed again. We don't know why. They lacked the opportunity, according to Paul here in verse 10. Was it their own poverty? The churches in Macedonia were poor churches. And you know what? For them to meet Paul's need would have come a great sacrifice. And maybe for a time, they just didn't have that extra money. Was it because um, Paul was hard to find? They had no access to him? Was it because they had nobody like Epaphroditus who was able to go on their behalf? Maybe Paul didn't need the help until recently. We don't know the exact reason, but you know what? They, had, they would want to help him, and they had helped him in the past. It had been a while since they helped him, but now they're helping him again. And Paul paints this beautiful picture of spring. And here's the way I like to look at it. He was enjoying a little bit of spring in the middle of winter. Now, speaking metaphorically, he's in prison. He's under house arrest. In chapter 1, he says, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. I'm kind of caught between those two thoughts. If I live, then that's good. I'll be able to minister to you and bless the churches. But if I don't live, then for me to live is Christ and to die again. 
And he says, I really don't know what's going to happen. But here in the middle of his winter, he's enjoying a little bit of spring. I think one of the nicest things ever said to me as a pastor was by a woman in my first church in the United States at Placerita Baptist Church. She had struggled with depression often and I'd counseled her on several occasions. And, and when I was leaving that church to go to a church in Ohio, she just thanked me for my ministry in her life and told me how she would miss me. And then she said this, Pastor, you have been a ray of sunshine to me. It's a beautiful statement. I don't tell you that story to draw attention myself, but either a pastor to people or a congregation among themselves. Let's, let's bring a little bit of spring to each other's lives. Let's think about each other and allow our thoughts to blossom again and flourish again where we minister to one another. Now, now before I go on, just talking about his, his celebration, while the secret to his contentment is the strength that Christ supplies regardless of the circumstance, I do think it's worth noting that that Thanksgiving, gratitude, appreciation, that's a good antidote to discontentment. In the context of contentment, Paul rejoices. And if we were to kind of flip that on its, its head, I think he's reminding us, if you want to fight discontentment, then you've got to deal with a murmuring and grumbling spirit. In fact, in chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, he'll tell them, right? Do all things without grumbling and murmuring. Stop your belly aching. Stop moaning and groaning. And here he rejoices in the Lord. He, he, he focuses not on what he doesn't have. He doesn't focus on his circumstances, which are not ideal. He focuses on God's goodness. He focuses on people's kindness. He takes stock of what he should appreciate. And I would just throw it your way that a spirit of thanksgiving is a great antidote against discontentment. We don't have time to develop this, but if you develop a spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude, I think it will, um, fo- uh, it, it will uh, cause you to be humble. It will foster humility. And I think it's hard for discontentment to take a root in a life that's marked by humility. Because when you and I appreciate all that God has given us, we'll also be mindful most of it we don't deserve. You know, you know the statement where someone is asked how they're doing, they said, better than I deserve. You know what a sinner saved by God's grace, those who deserved his wrath. Most days we, we, need, we can say that about anything and everything. I'm doing better than I deserve. And when you and I create that kind of culture of appreciating God's grace and his goodness, it will foster humility and it's hard for discontentment to take root in the soil of gratitude that produces humility. And it not only produces humility, it engenders hope. Because as you and I take stock of God's goodness, as we count his blessings and we name them one by one, hope rises because we kind of go, you know what? Why am I worried about the future when the past tells me God's faithful? So, So gratitude not only fosters humility and it not only engenders hope, I'll tell you another thing, it breeds perspective. If you come to a situation like Paul does here, with the perspective of gratitude, you'll be surprised how many blessings you've missed and you begin to see. Let me give you a classic example of this. Love this story and we'll move on. You ever heard of Matthew Henry? Well, he's a commentator. Uh, Long ago was among the Puritans and uh, most preachers have his one volume on all of the Bible and it's still good today. Well, he was once robbed. And, and uh, he reflected on this assault and robbery that he had just gone through. And, and he looked at it with a perspective of humility and gratitude and thanksgiving. And here's what he saw. Now, I, I wouldn't see this. I don't know if you would see this, but he came up with this. Number one, I'm thankful it was the first time I was robbed. It's good. I wouldn't have come up with that. I'm like all points bullet and let's get the guy and kill him. (laughs) Number two, thankful that they took my wallet but not my life. Wow. Three, thankful there wasn't much in the wallet. (laughs) Four, 
Thankful that it was me and not someone else. Wow. That's gratitude. And when you have a spirit of gratitude, it it, it brings perspective on circumstances. So that's his celebration. Let's move on. His contentment. His contentment. Now, we have his celebration in verse 10, but we have his contentment introduced in verse 11. But look at how he introduces, almost with a contrast, it's abrupt. Not that I speak in regard to want. How interesting. He's just thanked them for meeting his need. He's just thanked them that Epaphroditus has come, brought the gift, and ministered to his necessity. Read about it in chapter 2, 25 to 30. But then he he kind of, it's almost like while he reaches out his hand in terms of a compliment, in verse 11, he kind of takes it back. Kind of, thank you, but almost a no thanks. Not, Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He, he kind of gives them thanks and then he seems to take it back, but he does that with a good purpose. Because remember, he's about to talk to them about contentment. And while he is thankful for what they have done, he wants them to know whether they did it or not, he would have remained content. So while he's thankful, he wants them to know, hey, you need to know what I'm thankful that you have relieved my emergency and my uh, necessity. I do want to use that occasion to just remind you that my contentment, my peace, my joy lies somewhere else. In fact, you know what's interesting? If you look at verse 17, Paul's more excited about what the gift is that they give to him will do for them. Look at verse 17. Not that I seek the gift. Again, he's back to this issue. Thank you for what you gave, but I didn't seek it. And my contentment's not based on it. And he goes on in verse 7, but but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Very interesting. Thankful for what you did. I can't say I haven't enjoyed it. But I want you to know I don't speak in the context of need. I didn't seek your gift. In fact, I'm glad for what the gift's going to do for you. I think that's going to rebound to your eternal reward. Because God's not unmindful of our gifts and kindness. But he wants them to know he's got a contentment that doesn't rise or fall on the kindness, acceptance, affirmation of other people. Which makes me go back, okay, let's, Paul, talk about this contentment because I need this kind of contentment. Because, you see, life is 90% what you make it and only 10% or or how you take it. It's only 10% what you make it. Life is more a matter of reaction than action. So there's three things about the contentment quickly. Do take some notes. I think you'll find this helpful. This was a dynamic contentment, a developing contentment, and a divine contentment. Let's move as quickly as we can. A dynamic contentment. This was a contentment that would grow and glow in any situation. If, if you were to make contentment a plant, it was a perennial. It bloomed all year round. It, it would grow in the most arid of circumstances. Sunshine, clouds. Contentment's perennial. Look at his language In verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, notice the words, in whatever state, you name it, good, bad, or ugly. Weekdays, weekends, doesn't matter. I've been content. Look at the language again in verse 12. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. Doesn't leave anything out, does it? So contentment, in Paul's experience, can live in any situation, regardless of the circumstance. In fact, these words, a base and a bound, are interesting verbs in the Greek. They're kind of technical terms, and according to some study I've done, in extra-biblical language, they can be used for the ebb and the flow of the ocean. 
And if that's true, that's a wonderful picture. Paul's saying, I've learned to be content when the incoming tide of God's blessing touches my life or when it recedes and goes out. And I'm in a difficult situation. Tied in, tied out. In blessing, out of blessing. Doesn't matter. Whatever that circumstance, I can be content. Now, I've got to make an application. It's Sunday and Monday's coming. This is pastoral exposition. So, so that's a challenge, isn't it? Because Paul turns our thinking on its head. Because our happiness, our contentment, our peace, our joy is usually tied to happenings. Our happiness is usually tied to happenings. And it usually goes something like this. If she did that, or if he did that, I would be happy. If I get a raise, I'll be content. If I get a good doctor's report, I'll be content. And then that's how we view life. We argue that if the circumstances would change, our attitude would be better. But ask me, can you, can you fit that into the thinking of Paul here? Is that the way he's thinking? You know what? Thank you for what you've done. God willing, the circumstances are going to change here. I'll enter into some better weather and I'll be happy. No, thank you for what you've done, but I didn't seek your gift. You want to know how I'm doing? I'm content regardless of the circumstance. Glad Epaphroditus is here, but even when he was here, he almost died. And I was, it would have to endure sorrow upon sorrow. But you, you just need to know that the contentment I'm talking about here is dynamic. It can live anywhere and go anywhere. But you and I often, our happiness and our contentment is conditional. It's if this happens... Or if that doesn't happen, I'll be good. Maybe you can identify with a poem that Charles Swindoll expresses in one of his books. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors, it was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool dry air, it was fall, but it was winter I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season, it was winter, but it was spring I wanted. The warm and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle-aged I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life is over, and I never got what I wanted. That's kind of where we're at most of the time. But that's not what's being described here. Which, which would remind us something, by the way. Take this down. Paul is reminding us that contentment is internal, not external. His contentment has nothing to do with what's going on around him. Because he's learned to be content in whatsoever state he finds himself. Moves on. It's a developing contentment. Look at the language he uses. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have what? Learned. So this is a contentment that he has learned over time. It has developed within him. Notice verse 12, for I know how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. Notice again, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Contentment doesn't come instinctively or instantly. Glad to know that. This is something that we must cultivate. It's a grace that we must allow the Lord to develop us in. It's not the fruit of a certain temperament. Okay? You know, you do some kind of psychological analysis on yourself and, and you come to this conclusion, you know, I don't have one of those temperaments that leans towards contentment. It's not what Paul's talking about. It's not a spiritual gift. Endowed by the Holy Spirit. It's not the outcome of a circumstance or crisis where uh, over one weekend or some one season you went through and you come out the other end content. This isn't effortless. This requires commitment, learning, industry on your part. In fact, these are two Greek words. They look like they're the same in our English text. Learned, verse 11. Learned, verse 12. Well, the one in verse 11 is a normal Greek word that carries the idea of just learning by experience. 
So Paul has said, hey, I've learned in life, experience the seasons I've gone through, how to be content. But the second word is an interesting word in verse 12. It actually comes out of the pagan mystery religions, the secret cults and societies where there are degrees of knowledge. Maybe if I was to kind of illustrate it, if you've watched maybe an Indiana Jones movie or National Treasure, you know as they're hunting for the treasure, they get into some kind of, you know, cave or, a, or, or a, a, you know, a room and it's locked and, and they're in that room until they discover some level of knowledge, some key of understanding, and all of a sudden, you know, the wall parts of the door opens and then into another room or another part of, 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 of the challenge. And that's our word. And Paul's kind of using that image. And he's saying, you know, I've learned contentment and, and God has put me in certain situations where I've learned something about myself, good and bad. I've learned something about the fleeting nature of life. I've learned something about the character of God. I've learned something about the mystery of His providence. And I was there for a time. And once I learned that, then I was taken to another level of learning, another experience, where again I came to understand something about myself and others and life. And I kept going through these kind of situations until I've kind of got to that place where I have learned what contentment is. I've been baptized into so many difficult situations. I've come to understand a measure of the mystery of God's providence, the truth of the sufficiency of God's grace, the faithfulness of God's character, the incompleteness of human beings. I've learned all of that, and it is all playing into me being a man who's content. And, and that, what's the lesson of that? When you're in a situation, ladies and gentlemen, not to your liking, and God locks you up in a room, and life becomes mysterious, and it's not what you'd like it to be, you need to become a student, not a victim. You need to be a student, not a victim. What are you learning? Don't be belly aching. Guard your house against, or your heart against bitter judgments on yourself or other people. What are you learning? What is the lesson God wants to teach you? You need to be a student, not a victim. And Paul seems to have had that perspective. I was willing to learn different levels of knowledge about myself, others, life, and the mystery of God's providence. And it has produced in me a maturity. And by the way, just as a footnote, that would seem to me, listen, this is to our older saints, our senior saints. I'd like to believe, sadly it's not the case, I'd like to believe that the most mature and mellow people in the church are the senior saints because they've had a lifetime to learn contentment. And if it is learned over time, I think it's harder for young people than it is for older people. Because if they have learned the lessons that God has wanted them to learn, then they must be the most mellow, chilled out people on the planet. But often they're not. Someone has said that a sour old Christian is the devil's crowning work. It's true. A senior saint ought not to be a whiny old Christian. They ought to be mellow in temperament, robust in faith and content in life. Sadly, it's not often the case because they didn't learn their lessons. But not to pick on them. We all need to learn our lessons. Are you learning what God wants you to learn about yourself, a fallen world, the sufficiency of His grace, the workings of His Spirit, the sufficiency of His strength? Later this year, Ray Pritchard, a friend of mine, who's an author, is coming to speak at our men's conference. And in, it, in one of his books, Men of Honor, he talks about something he heard one day on the radio on Moody Broadcasting Network, where a man said about the situation he was going through, when times become hard, be a student, not a victim. So I, that's where I got my thought. 
Be a student, not a victim. And Ray Pritchard went home and he started to think about that and listen to this. He wrote it down. You know what? You need to Google this. Put in Ray Pritchard, victim, not a student. You need to download this thing and, and, and frame it. Put it inside your Bible. I'll read a few of the things he wrote. A victim says, why did this happen to me? A student says, what can I learn from this? A victim blames others for his problems. A student says, how much of this did I bring on myself? A victim looks at everyone else and cries out, life isn't fair. A, vic- a, a, a student looks at life and says, what happened to me could happen to anybody. A victim believes that hard times have come because God is trying to punish him. A student understands that God allows hard times in order to help us grow. A victim would rather complain than find a solution. A student has no time to complain because he's busy making the best of the situation. A a victim believes the deck of life is forever stacked against him. A student believes God is able to reshuffle the deck anytime he wants. A victim begs God to remove all the problems of his life so that he can be happy. A student has learned through the problems of his life that God alone is the source of happiness. Probably the best of all of them. But that's a wonderful thing. I have a copy of that for all my family, my three daughters, my wife, myself. It's great. So, because life will always bring its challenges. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And when I'm in that kind of situation, not to my liking, when I've teed up the ball and I've taken a good swing at success and now I'm lying in the rough, I've got to learn to play the ball where life drops it. And I've got a choice. Am I going to become bitter or am I going to become better? Am I going to become a student and learn contentment? Or am I going to become a victim and be a problem to everybody around me? Toxic, bitter, angry, ungracious. All right, last thought here on this. This isn't only just a, a dynamic contentment and, and not a, only a developing contentment, it's a divine contentment. Let's go back to our text. In fact, let's go back to our word. We're talking about contentment these last 30 minutes, and yet I haven't defined it. What is contentment? Well, the word carries the idea of self-mastery. The Greek word here is actually somewhat of a stoic word, a philosopher's term. It speaks of the ability to be free from want and need. Now, in Stoicism... It's self-mastery. It's kind of to detach yourself from others. They kind of downplay your emotions and your feelings. It's the, it's the, the British stiff upper lip. It's kind of grin and bear it. It's, you know, dig deep. It speaks of fortitude and independence. That's our word, contentment. Now, Paul takes that word. And he baptizes it. He's certainly not denying his emotions here. He talks about rejoicing and the love he has for these people. And he doesn't carry the idea of self-mastery. He he, he takes that word and carries the idea of self-sufficiency. And says, no, my sufficiency is of God. The Stoic wants to be self-sufficient independent of others, depending on himself, self-mastery. Paul says, I like the concept, but, but, but the Christian's life isn't marked by self-sufficiency. It's marked by a God-sufficiency. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have a sufficiency. I can be the master of every circumstance and myself, my moods, my feelings, because there's a strength and a grace supplied to me through Christ that enables me to do that. By the way, let me come back to that thought. I'm going to give you three things, by the way. You need to write these down uh, because Paul has argued them. If what we're saying is true, dynamic, developing, divine contentment, then contentment is internal, not external, right? Secondly, contentment is learned. It's not intuitive. And thirdly, contentment is divine in origin, not human. Wasn't Paul saying in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5, who is sufficient for these things? You know, we see him almost running off the map in terms of mission enterprise and planting churches all across the Roman Empire. How do you explain this? Paul says, well, don't be looking at me. 
who is sufficient for these things, but our sufficiency is from God. I, I love this verse. Over in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake it became poor, that we through his uh, poverty might be made rich. And you scroll down to chapter 9 and verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Talk about being ready for anything. Parachute a Christian into any circumstance And if they're a student of God's grace and the work of Christ and the sufficiency of God's purpose for us, they'll be a student, not a victim in any circumstance, and they're ready for it. Because they have a sufficiency from God. In fact, let me quote Wearsby, and we'll get to our last thought. I took an idea from him, and I think it's worth just quoting it. Contentment, then, is actually containment. Having the spiritual resources within to face life courageously and handle it successfully. Contentment is divine adequacy. Contentment is having that artesian well within so that you don't have to run to the broken cisterns of the world to get what you need. The power of Christ in the inner man is all that we need for the demands of life. Resources on the outside such as friends and counselors and encouragements are only helpful as they strengthen our resources on the inside. It's a good, actually, word to swap contentment with containment. It's that stoic idea, mastery, self-sufficiency. Paul says, I'm taking it, but I'm baptizing it with a Christian meaning. I am a contained man because within me is Christ the hope of glory, and within Christ is all the fullness of God. And that makes me ready for every circumstance. I think I read a quote by R.C. Sproul some years ago. It just comes to my mind. It's not in my notes. God doesn't need me to be me for him to be him. But God, I need God to be him for me to be me. And, and we have God within. Brings us to our last thought quickly. His celebration, his contentment, his confidence, because the one leads to the other. He, if, we, if we've understood the word contentment right, it's a divine adequacy. Then it is no wonder, in verse 13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm a contained man. I've got an adequacy and a sufficiency for every circumstance. Paul's contentment was anything but stoic. When he says, I can do all things, he's not saying, you know what, I have got reserves of human will that enables me to master my circumstances. That's what the stoic would say, but that's not what Paul is saying. As we've said, Paul is saying, I have an artesian well of spiritual strength through union with Jesus Christ and communion with Jesus Christ that enables me to be more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. I've quoted him twice. Why not three times? Wearsby. He kind of takes us through the text as we come to a close. We can accept all things, verses 11 to 12, because we can do all things, verse 13, because in Christ we have all things, verse 19. Just scroll down to verse 19. And and since they have been kind to Paul and they have kind of met met him, uh, uh, his need out of their generosity, he does remind them, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Do you notice that little phrase, according to his riches? Commensurate with his riches. Think about how bountiful the blessings and supply of God can be. And out of that ocean, my God can supply your need. If you're a thimble of need, he's got an ocean of provision. And when I was a young Christian in Northern Ireland, an old pastor underscored that. I've never forgotten what he said. Paul didn't say out of the riches of his glory. He said according to 
the riches of his glory. And he gave this illustration. I'll update it. Bill Gates, billionaire, owns Microsoft. And you know what? Someday I bump into him. Somehow he takes a liking to him. And I tell him, hey, we've got a need over at Kenwood Community Church. Hey, Bill, would you like to write a check and help us out? He goes, surely I would. And I go, woo. And he writes me a check for $1,000. It's not peanuts, but it is peanuts to Bill Gates. $1,000. He's given me out of his riches. But if he's going to give me according to his riches, I'm looking a million dollars. That would be according to his riches. And it's wonderful. That's what Paul is saying here to the Philippians. Hey, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And my God will supply all your need according to his riches. And how rich is God? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So stop your belly aching. Stop your worrying. Stand up in the middle of life circumstances and live like a victorious Christian. You're making God look poor when he's rich. Stop it. In fact, this is a present tense verb. So you can read it like this. I can do all things through Christ who keeps pouring his strength into me. Here's where we're wrapping up. You said, well, you said that a minute ago. I know, but hey. John 1.16. Let's go there. John 1.16. I, uh, uh, I love this verse as we kind of close up. Because I want to give you an image of, I think, what Paul's driving at here. I can do all things through Christ who keeps pouring his strength into me. And by the way, just a little footnote. The all things... You need to be careful with that. Okay? This is a, a verse that's been abused and misused. I can do all things through Christ, so let's try and raise the dead. Let's try and heal the sick. I can do all things through Christ. I can shoot 69 the next time I'm on a golf course. In fact, some pastors even abuse this verse. And they go to someone who's not equipped or gifted for a ministry and they're hesitant to do that ministry and the pastor says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's a misuse of this verse. The all things of verse 13 are tied to the all things of verses 11 and 12. What's the all things? It's the all kinds of circumstance God puts you in in his providence. So don't abuse the verse. But when we're in any kind of circumstance, we're ready for anything that circumstance throws our way because Christ keeps pouring his strength into us. Look at John 1, 16. Of his fullness, we have received grace for grace. The Greek there is grace in the place of grace. Grace following grace. So imagine you're by, by a, a flowing stream or a river. Now when you look at that river from back here, it's just one kind of block of water. But if you go to the edge of the river or the stream, stand there and just pick a spot right in front of your feet. And if you'll watch long enough, you'll see it's water replacing water. It's water instead of water. That's the image of John 1.16. This ever-flowing stream of mercy and goodness that God keeps sending our way, saving grace, suffering grace, serving grace, singing grace. Do a little bit of word study on the word grace, and you'll find all kinds of grace in the New Testament. It's all ours for whatever circumstance we're in. Let me ask you as we close, what kind of Christian are you this morning? Because there are only two kinds of Christians there's what I call thermometer Christians and thermostat Christians. What's a thermometer? Well, a thermometer is an instrument that registers the temperature. The nurse will stick one under your tongue. And it will register the, body of your, the heat of your body if you've got a temperature or whatever. That's a thermometer. A thermometer simply registers the context. A thermostat... Well, I've got one in my hotel room and I like to turn it up to about 75. I'm freezing to death over here. And I regulate the room temperature. I got to feel like I'm not that far from Southern California. And you know what? I think there are two kinds of Christians. There are thermometer Christians and thermostat Christians. You, you put a certain Christian in a circumstance and sadly they're like a thermometer. 
you know, it's a rough situation, it's a bitter situation, it's a tough situation. Before long, they start feeling like that situation and reflecting that situation. And they're down in the mouth and they're simply reflecting the kind of negative vibes that that context is. That's bad. And they're the kind of Christian who says, if this happens, I would be happy. But then there's the thermostat Christian, the Paul type. Put them anywhere and they'll regulate their response to the circumstance. And they'll bring the strength of Christ and the grace of God to bear upon that circumstance. And they won't go, if this would happen, I'd be happy. They will go, I am happy because God loves me. The Spirit of God indwells me. I've got all the exceeding promises of God, so I'm up for this. I don't know how long it's going to last, but I'm sufficient in Christ. All things will work together for good. And I'm going to learn something about God, myself, and the purposes of God. And I'm going to come out the side of this more mature and more effective for Jesus Christ. Play the ball where life drops it, folks. God can enable you to do that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time this morning. In such a rich letter, such a joyful letter, where Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Oh God, we have to admit, too often we're murmuring and we're grumbling. We're too often like the thermometer. We're just registering the, the difficult, negative circumstances we're in. We're not overcoming. We're, we're surrendering. We're becoming a victim and not a student. We're making you look bad. We're not being overcomers and conquerors. Lord, help us to be students. Help us to be thermostats. Help us to learn what Paul learned that we can do all things through Christ who pours the strength that we need in the given situation to live for the glory of God and overcome. And these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think we're dismissed. God.